we are on. Um, today's guest, I'm very happy to have him on. He's one of my favorite chaps to talk to. Uh, if you are from the greater Toronto area and you listen to Q107, you like your classic rock in the afternoon on your drive home, you might know this guy. If you like listening to podcasts about fandom and uh, Star Wars, and you might like, you might know this guy. That's how I listened to him or found him. <laughs> and if you go to Comic Cons in Toronto, he's probably hosted a couple of the best panels, and he's got comics for you. This yeah. guy's Fred Kennedy. Welcome Thank to the you. Omniverse, dude. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. I'm stoked to be here, brother. Yeah, You're we're... hosting panels, too, by the way. I saw you at the last con. You were hosting a bunch of them. I was like, look at this guy. He's coming after me now. <laughs> All right, that's cool. I, that's what I said. I said, if I ever get to host panels, I want that guy's spot. Because <laughs> to me, to, to be honest with you, and I'm not just saying this, and it's your job, so it's like you're supposed to kind of be good at that sort of thing. But it was always a much more fun, comfortable experience when you would do a sketch duel or a creator spotlight. Like you knew when to get out of the way and you also knew when to entertain the the, the audience. It was a nice experience when you'd host a panel. So I, I took a lot of that from from you and be like, okay, when I do an interview or I talk to people, you got to have that sort of that vibe with them. Have you ever had a moment where the crowd kind of like turns on one of the people on the panel? No, no, because... <laughs> Go ahead. What happened Marco to Marco Djurjevic, when Marco Djurjevic, like this is a few years ago, when he announced that he was retiring and he announced that he was retiring, he's just done with comic books. And I loved his run with Thor and all that stuff. I think he's one of the best artists going, you know, and uh, he announced that he was retiring and then it broke and he was on stage and um, he was just like being frank. Like people were asking why you want to leave comics and he was just being straight up. The crowd being like, it's not worth my time. He goes, the amount of money, the time that I put in versus the amount of money that I get. He goes, I'm drawing all these amazing things, but I don't own anything that I'm drawing. I'm done with it. He goes, mm -hmm. I'm going to go back into like concept work. And then someone stood up and this drives me batty and comic fandoms, like pop culture fandoms can be like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Someone said, who pissed in your cornflakes? And I'm like, are you kidding? Like this guy sitting up here on stage drawing sketches for you that you can win. He's giving you your time and you're going to disrespect him because he's saying the truth and you don't like it. That, that really turned, I, and I got really huffy puffy when I was on the microphone. I got, I turned on the crowd <laughs> and then the crowd started clapping and I'm like, yeah, take that guy. I got you. <laughs> it was like a wrestling promotion. Exactly. You're, it was just like that. getting back at him. He was the heel and you were the baby mm. face. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I got pushed. The crowd pushed me. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't had any experiences like that yet, but I have had. Um, and it's one of those things where you just kind of we're on a tangent here, but it's a good one. I could use the the info from you. But there's been times <laughs> where I've I've been prepared for it. And then the very last minute, none of the people wanted to participate in it for one reason or the other. So the whole panel completely changes with people I had no idea that were going to be on it, whether they knew each other. You know what I mean? So you really have oh, to yeah. kind of go on the fly. So it's like, don't be too worried about what you know, what you don't know, because anything can change. You know, it's wild. Like the, the I always have a few like bucket questions. I always have a few questions that I ask every time I do it. But it's really good that. I'll give you some legitimate broadcasting tips. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> the key thing about interviewing is listening and responding. So yeah. you can you can play, you can have it all planned out, but never walk in with more than five or seven questions because what you want to do is craft a conversation with the person that you're talking to. Right. And like that five or seven questions thing, like when I say that, some people are like, well, that's not really good. Like you should be familiar mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. who they are, read about them, but go in with five to seven things you really want to know. And if you've got a crowd, that's that's it. Because it's not about us as the host. It's not about the person on stage asking the questions. The people that are in the crowd, they want to ask what they want to ask. And there's a lot of time where you as the host have this mentality that you got to get really deep and ask them these really metaphysical questions. Mm -hmm. But then you turn it over to the crowd and they're like, Who's your favorite superhero to draw? And it's like, <laughs> we think, we think as the host, that that's a pretty lame question to ask, but the audience wants it. And so what you're doing is you're giving the audience what they want. And when they hear enough audience members asking questions like that, 
it'll prompt that one or two people in the crowd who have like a really deep question that they've been thinking about for a long time to ask their own questions. And so when they ask their questions, you kind of jump in and then you feed with a few things based on the answers that they're giving. Always be listening to what they're saying. Well, the moderator, know? like be a moderator. Yeah, conversation. Exactly. Like if you at some point, even sometimes when you talk to somebody, they might not be in the most chatty of moves. Like they they might totally. the way they end their sentences are very like, and that was that. And you're like, oh, I wasn't I thought you might yeah. have a little bit of a, a tag at the at the end of that sentence. But then you could just look at the audience like, hey, what do you guys want to ask? Yeah. And depending on the size and whatnot, some people can become a little bit more brave or or shy, but there'll be something. Somebody wants yeah. to ask something. So totally. Yeah. I do the the hardest one I ever had to do was a panel with Brian Azzarello, which was frustrating because I'm a huge Brian Azzarello fan. Like huge. Like 100 Bullets was the book that got me back into comics. Right. But he's he writes these incredibly deep woven stories, like one of the best Wonder Woman writers ever. Yeah, um, his his run with Constantine was fantastic, and uh, get him on stage and he was like one or two word answers. It was so hard to do, man. Yeah, it was, and it was like, and I'm like, I've got these deep questions because I'm a big fan, and then it's like, no, not at all. Okay, all right, next question. <laughs> it was so yeah, hard to do. yeah, yeah. That happened with, uh, I tell a story about Michael Golden. Me and, uh, you know, Martin Duncan. Yes. Me and him Martin went to Hamilton. Martin Slam Duncan. Ma Martin <laughs> Slam Duncan. That's right. Shout yeah. out to Martin. We, Me and him were at Hamilton Comic Con a bunch of years ago when we were starting out with this podcast thing. And he was so nice to talk to. And he had all this, like, behind the scenes info and and things to look for in his posters and things that he did for Star Wars. And then we're like, can we can we interview you for an episode? He's like, yeah, sure, that'd be great. You know, I was in radio broadcasting and I used to do these commercials. So like I like he I was a trained voice actor. I'm like, great, you're, you're gonna be. And then he got on and he's like, yeah, I don't like Star Wars. We're like, ah. <laughs> I'm just like, did this guy just do that to fuck with us or what? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it felt like it. But um, yeah, it, it can definitely be tricky. happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So I don't know if there's any way for me to to make this happen, but. Now that you may have to be on panels as the comic creator, yeah, I'd like to host your panel. I don't get a say in it, but I know, like, absolutely, I will make sure that, like, I'll talk in Toronto. I'll yeah. make sure that I will pull some strings as <laughs> I can because I host a lot of the panels. So I'll make sure that you get the, I'll make sure you get the call. I'll feed you some great questions too. Yeah, there you that's go. That's a real, that's a really good question. <laughs> 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 we'll talk about all the things that you're dying to share with people. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to believe this, but. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's get into it. Since, uh, I mean, you were a, a frequent guest in a way on the cave. We had you on three times and uh, we've chatted at cons and, and for many years of seeing each other. But this is your first time entering the, the Omniverse Comics Guide. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to do the origin story a little bit, Fred. So. Tell us where where the love of imagination and fandom comes from. Where was that first thing that sparked like, wow, there's something out there in the imagination universe for you? You know, it, I I would have to say it's Star Wars. Yeah. Watching Star Wars as a kid. Yeah. Um, but I was doing some thinking about this, about how the someone asked me about before that, like what was before Star Wars? Was there anything like that? And I would say. Like He-Man was probably mm -hmm. it. Like as a really little kid, I loved, I loved He-Man. I still love He-Man. And the thing is, is like, I find that like He-Man fans are slowly, every fandom is turning into like these weird toxic environments where they feel the need to dump on anything that doesn't check all their boxes. Like the new He-Man show from Kevin Smith. Like I thought it was fine. I don't get what all of the anger is. Is it what I expected it to be? No. Is it what I would have done? No. Does that make it bad? Again, not at all. Like, I strapped in. I enjoyed the whole thing. I just yeah, want to be yeah. in there. Uh, so there's He-Man. And then, actually, Big Trouble in Little China would definitely be a huge, yeah. huge influence on me as a kid. That's like, cool. Because, like, that was in the 80s and 90s when everyone wanted to be, like, a ninja and stuff. And I right. think that 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 movie the three storms the scene where rain has got like the little blades that go around in his hands i wanted to have like something like that so bad <laughs> and star wars really but the thing was is that there was all these things 
But when Star Wars happened, it sort of like consumed everything. There was nothing to me like Star Wars ever, like before or since. And I just love Star Wars so much. And the, the lore about it and what was cool growing up in an era where there was just just the three movies and like I suppose there's the Ewoks movie we never really counted the Ewoks movie or even the <laughs> Ewoks cartoon or even like the droids cartoon actually the droids cartoon I really liked um, and we, we would build our own little Star Wars stories and stuff off of it Star Wars was a huge huge influence that was really it yeah, yeah Star Wars because Star Wars had that it had the swashbuckling aspects of things like Indiana Jones, but it also had that superhero element of mm-hmm. other, like there was powers and there was the samurai aspect of the Jedi with the, with the glowing sword. Like it was, there was everything in it, but it was definitely sci-fi. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it got, I don't know. It checks off all the boxes for us. Like the real nerds, right? My dad is a real is a real sci-fi head. Like he's a big sci-fi guy. And like, he was in the Navy and he said, he goes, most of the time when you're on the ships, he goes, this is before the internet. And so we didn't even, they didn't even have TVs on the ships really, because this hmm. is like the seventies, eighties. Uh, they would watch movies on VHS and stuff. He goes, most of the time, I would just be in my bunk and reading. And he read hard, heavy sci-fi mm-hmm. all the time. Right, he right, was, right. He was the first guy to explain to me, he said, Star Wars isn't sci-fi. He's like, it's not sci-fi. It's science fantasy. He goes, it's completely different. He goes, because... That's a good, that's a good description. He goes, so he is very big about, like, sci-fi has to have a scientific element, you know? where there's like a basis and an explanation and research. Uh, But Star Wars is like, it's warp core drive. Like if you watch Star Trek, Star Trek has a lot of science basis in it. And the things that they talk about in Star Trek are plausible scientific developments. No one's got the force. No. Star Trek, you know, like, so there's that (laughs) mystical element. And, and to be honest, I, I remember like we, my, my, like we went to like hippie church a lot growing up. Like that's like, like love is Jesus is love, man. Like that's the type of church we went to. And I remember one time <laughs> our, our Padre gave a, gave a sermon. I love that you uh, call him the Padre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's Padre, Padre Byzantin. Uh, he gave a survey and he was saying how all the important lessons about love and darkness and forgiveness and redemption can be found in star Wars. And I was like, Whoa, <laughs> blew my mind. And he's like, the idea, he, and he broke it down about how everyone condemns Vader. Like, everyone refuses to see that there's good and goodness and light still in him. But Luke is sees the light and sees that he can bring him back, that there is redemption, that there is forgiveness. And I think that the redemption arc in itself gets a little bit overdone now. Um, but the idea of that, there is goodness within all of us, you know, the, the core good in somebody can be reignited if somebody believes in them, you know, and, and I think that Star Wars has that shelf life and has that allure from being a child to today, because there's, it's like an onion. There's just, there's so many layers that you can go to and you've got even like, and that's why I, I still say that. I loved Andor. I really did love Andor, but I still haven't say, finished it yet. Haven't finished it. I'm not going to say anything. I loved it. Um, but Rebels, I think, is the best Star Wars since the original. And I say it's the best because it has all of those childlike elements of Star Wars, but also the real heavy redemption forgiveness the analysis of good versus evil and so often we find people wanting to reinvent the wheel and dave filoni didn't reinvent the wheel at all he just put a few new spokes in it you know and yeah he's got it he, he, he does he's, he's got the bendu it. the bendu is one of the cool like i love the bendu and i love the inquisitors i think the inquisitors are one of the coolest thing that's been added to star wars and so that show to me was just it just changed everything like it and that was the show that got my kids into star wars and so i have a profound amount of love and appreciation for rebels 
Like I know Mandalorian is awesome and I love Mandalorian and I loved Andor and I even like the new trilogy and I, and all of them, I enjoyed watching all of them. Um, do I think that they're like Oscar worthy Shakespeare? No, but I just enjoyed them. I enjoy all of it. And, but nothing struck a chord with me the way rebels did. I don't know. Have you seen rebels? I haven't watched rebels. Okay. I haven't seen clone wars. Most of <laughs> yeah. the stuff, most of the stuff that I've watched has always been in the live action realm. So the shows, like, yeah. I, the only thing I haven't caught up on is, um, and, or, like I said, I didn't watch bad batch, but it's weird. Cause I, I'm a big star Wars fan, but I'm not, there's like, I Dude, wouldn't so not, not like, not like yourself. Like you've got yeah. the, your boys are in, into it too. And you, you write about it like just for fun. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it's like, it, it means a lot. It's so much to so many different people. Cause it, it yeah. just, there's so much to grab onto in these stories of, like the the Mandalorian scratches a certain like Western itch, mixed with samurai, and there's yeah. that mythology and that sort of religious element to it. Like it's and then there's the Eastern philosophy with the Jedi in a way. Like there's so much to pick apart. Absolutely, and so many people have been involved in the writing process. And Sam Maggs has got that new book that she just dropped uh, like this week. I think she's. I know she's selling it at her table at Emerald City Con, and I'm super stoked to read it because I think Sam is one of the best writers out there these days. Uh, and that's a continuation of Jedi Fallen Order, which the game, honestly, I felt like the game was a little half cooked, but the story in the game was amazing. <laughs> the, the writing in the story was fantastic. It's just the game mechanics, even the game mechanics are good. It's just the, all of the the polish that they could have had, it felt like they had this amazing game in the works and someone was like, let's ship it. And they're like, okay. <laughs> but it was the story and the writing of the game and the characters. Like, I think that they did a phenomenal, phenomenal job in executing characters and adding to that mythos, again, of the Inquisitors, which I believe hmm. are the coolest addition to Star Wars in like the last decade. You know, yeah. everyone loves... Jin Jaren, not taking anything away from Pedro Pascal. He's amazing. And I and I don't get I love I love uh the Mandalorian, but the Inquisitors, oh, they're so cool. They're so cool, <laughs> man. They're so bad. So Star Wars was that one thing that really left yeah, the fingerprint. As like, we can tell, as we've just been talking yeah. about it, like 15 No, that's minutes. cool. <laughs> because I mean you you are and having spoken to you and, and seeing you engage with other creators, like you, you love Conan a lot. You, you, you got with dead Romans, like a clear love of history, Yeah. but then you, you're a big silver surfer fan. Oh, for sure. Right. That's Cause so, I think that all that stuff, the thing that I think draws me back to space and sci-fi is always that, you know, you can do anything with sci-fi and you can tell, uh, you can examine a story from antiquity and put it in sci-fi and people are like, wow, that's so novel and new. And it's like, it's actually like 4,000 years old, if you must know. Um, and I think, you know, what's, it's interesting. I didn't even realize I was doing it, but there's a cartoon that I loved as a kid uh, growing up in Belgium called Ulysses 31, uh, which is the Odyssey, but it's told in the future the 31st century. And mm -hmm. so it's like you got Ulysses trying to get home and it's, it's wild. It's pretty dope. It's, it's pretty good. I would encourage everybody to give it a go. Yeah. That that's how I feel when I read something like Exo Man of War. Yeah. It's like oh yeah. Sorry. Not Ulysses. Od Odysseus. Sorry. Odysseus. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And it's Odyssey. It yeah, the 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 nerd in us. We have to make sure we get it right, right? It's like I can't Someone get it wrong. Is They'll call angrily. me. Yeah, so they're, they're gonna call me on it. He doesn't yeah. know what he's talking about. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I, I, Exo Man of War. I wish more people read it because it, it scratches like that feeling of the Conan itch and the Roman Empire, but then you're in the future. Dude, I'm, and what's wild is like Carrie Nord. Bringing oh. back Conan for Dark Horse, then Carrie Nord when Valiant relaunches. That's Exo Manowar. I felt like I was riding a wave of everything is for me. It's so, right? I love Carrie Nord. He's so great. He's good. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and he was the perfect artist for both of those books. And he did a cover for Dead Romans, actually. Oh, he that's did great. A, he did a variant cover for issue one. The FOC, the Final Order Cutoff, was just the other day. 
So, and his, his, uh, it was funny because I was kind of like chirping him and Adam Gorham who did two variants for issue one. And I was like, who's going to get more orders? Which one of you guys? Is <laughs> yeah. That's great. So I, know, I, I have the numbers, but I'm not saying anything. I'm not, I'm not putting any fingers anywhere. I'm not going to. Is there, a, is there a, some, I will say it was very winner? close. It was yeah. very close. Oh, okay. So it's so, it's so close. I'm not even going to say. <laughs> so the, the numbers are definitely in. There's the numbers are in. Okay. The numbers right. are, well, the FOC no order numbers, but, but you never know. Like, we could sell out. Who knows? Like that's the what thing about, about the aftermarket? Whose covers yeah. gonna get more money? Ooh, yeah, the sketch covers. You know, it's the guy who does all my tattoos. He's gonna do a sketch oh, cover. Nice. He's gonna do a series of sketch covers of the the cast, who we would cast in the different roles in the book. Ooh, we should talk about cool. it. So we're like making yes. sense with it. Yeah, sorry, I'm. It's your no, show. No, that's okay. No, like, no, no. This is this is better like this. I want because you get to the personality of the creator is what also drives people to wanting to read the book, right? Because yeah. it gets them excited for something. You're when you when you're rich with knowledge about everything, mm. <laughs> in a way, people are like, I can't wait to see what they put into this because they're excited about it. You know? Oh what well, I mean? if you got some deep questions for me that we have not discussed <laughs> beforehand, I'm ready. I'm ready to hit. I'm ready to swing, buddy. Okay. All right. Let's let I was going to say um which comics were your favorites growing up, but we could get right into Dead Romans if you want to. Oh, uh, okay. The Infinity Gauntlet. Yeah. Uh Good and pick. T- so the Infinity Gauntlet was when we moved to Canada when I was 12, we were we were by a 7-Eleven and there was a Street Fighter and I've told this story a few times, but there was a Street was a Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition machine at the 7-Eleven yeah. by our house. And so I didn't have any real friends cuz we just moved to a new country so we would go i i would go by myself to the 7-eleven and you put your quarter on the machine right so you put your quarter on the machine so you get to go but there's like a row of quarters right you're in line this is this is 1991 um the summer of 91 and so i put the quarter on the machine to wait for my turn and then i just because the spinner rack was right there and then i just leaped through things on the spinner rack and that was when infinity gauntlet was coming out and so i read all but the fifth issue. I read, I didn't get to read the fifth one, but I read the sixth one. So I knew how it all ended. But that was the first trade paperback that I ever bought, too. I bought the trade paperback like three years later. But I remember reading it. And what I loved about the comic was that everyone was in it. And like there was all the superheroes. And I remember like thinking, like, oh, would you want anything else? It's got everybody. It's got all the superheroes. Like, this is all you want. And there was one specific panel that always like sticks out to me. It's right at the, I think it's the first issue i think it's the first issue where it shows spider-man and his spider sense goes off when everyone dies right when the snap happens Mm. and he's hanging upside down and it's a really cool like page and it's ron Lim that did it and it's got spider-man hanging upside down and it's all like black and white and then the spider symbol in the background and that's when like he the spider sense happens and i remember thinking that's so cool <laughs> just like i like <laughs> reading it like seeing it on the newsprint and the comics back then they were always on that like terrible yeah. trade paper but yeah like i i loved that book that book really popped for me and i it got me into like wolverine and that scene where adam warlock kind of like tells the hulk and wolverine being like listen if we need two guys to die trying to kill him, you're the two guys that are going to do that and they're both like okay <laughs> like both were like all right if that's what ready. we gotta yeah, do yeah yeah yeah, so to see Wolverine and the Hulk, like these two are gonna go after someone together. It's like this is on. This is gonna be <laughs> great. I love yeah. it. So yeah, love the Infinity Gauntlet series. Yeah, I mean, I got I got him doing the snap over my shoulder. Like I yeah, I, I agree with you on that one. Um, actually, speaking of of Thanos and and the build up to the Infinity Gauntlet, you had an episode on issue zero where you got into like the the return of Thanos. Oh yeah, in those Silver Surfer uh, issues, and you really, really made it sound compelling. I'm like, the way he's <laughs> describing this is so epic. Like, I, I need to read it. So that's Thanos Quest, and, that, and yeah, it's like the if you buy, you can buy a trade called the Rebirth of Thanos, and it yes. has Thanos Quest in it. And one of the interesting things about Thanos Quest is the font usage that they have in it. It's got like this weird. 80s computer font that that makes no sense it's really weird to have it in a comic that's honestly one of the first things that stands out but that bill that's the prelude 
to the Infinity Gauntlet, and it's got this, it's six or eight pages, and it's brilliantly written. Like, it's Starlin at his best. Yeah. And it's like, he's, it's Silver Surfer basically being like, I'm going to kill you again, Thanos. And Thanos is like, why? Here's why I'm right. And he breaks it down and just like, and then you read it and you're like, that was 30 years ago. And the things that he was saying are more right now than they were when he right. did it. And when the movie came out and then when they brought everyone back, I was like, I think they made things worse. <laughs> I remember that episode back. too. Yeah. And I, yeah. I tell people whenever I watch, I'm like, you know, the Avengers are kind of assholes for everything. Yeah. They did, right. Like they kind of ruined everybody's life. Yeah. And and so what, like, what do you mean? <laughs> if you break down the logistics yeah of what they did it is horrific like they made it really things, is and and that is why that is my favorite thing about uh falcon and winter soldier that they touched on that because she's like we were finally accepted because she's talking about like migrant workers it's like we were finally we finally had our spot in the world and then when you brought everyone back we were brushed under the carpet again like we didn't exist and it was like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's it would it would be a lot more complicated than just on your yeah. left. <laughs> you get remarried. You get remarried because your spouse died and their kids are gone. Now you've got a new spouse, and then they got kids that you've made together. And now yeah. you're like if honestly, you know who made out best? The lawyers. Lawyers made bank <laughs> after the Avengers brought her. They were making money like crazy. Everyone on earth is broke. Except the lawyers. Except the lawyers. Like, they accept the, and how many people are going to sue the Avengers for like emotional damages from bringing Every, like it's this is I'm telling you they were wrong. <laughs> like I'm not saying I'm not saying Thanos snapping was okay. Don't get me wrong, he's got some very strong arguments, but bringing <laughs> everyone back was worse than him doing the snap. And that's my take. That's it. I'm putting that to bed. Whenever my wife watches something on YouTube or on CNN or whatever news channel is like you're skimming through and you see some new bullshit going on, she always says like, Thanos was right. Yeah, yeah. Thanos <laughs> was right. He was right. I agree with him. Yeah. There you go. Uh, that's hilarious. Yeah. No, good call. Good call. Infinity Gauntlet's a special one. Um, Let's talk about Dead Romans. Let's get into it. All From right. Soups to Nuts. How did this all come together? Because I know the the coming together of you and Nick working on the book is special. You being with Image, but also your your passion for Roman history. Give me so, give me give it all. Okay, little kid, because yep. we lived in Belgium, we went to uh, an archaeological dig site, and there was a, a I think it was Belgia. It was one of the tribes that lived in Belgium um in red around where we were so it could have been they could have been gauls now that i think about it because we lived in southern belgium right along the border of france uh in the anno province and the so we went to this village that was recreated and it was right by a roman settlement and that i i it was like one of the first times where i was trying to like your little kid brain is trying to figure out the realities of what it is that you're seeing you know mm -hmm. and so the I remember our teacher saying the Belgii and all these tribes were just like eradicated. Like the Romans came in and just killed them all because they wouldn't submit to Roman rule. And I was like, what do you mean they killed them all? And then they're like, they just, they, they killed them all. They all died. And it's like, okay. And then we go outside and there's like a hill and there's it's this famous hill where there was like a big battle and Caesar almost lost. Like he almost like got killed. It was like it could have gone either way. And so this is the hill where Julius Caesar was there. And you're like, I know who Julius Caesar is. So he's real. And he was here 2,000 years ago. Hmm. hmm. And then we got, I remember getting like some Asterix and Obelisk comics because like I was begging for something. And just reading those was like, they're little kid comics, but they really, they flipped some switches in my brain about giving me an interest in, in Roman history and all that stuff. So that's really like, if I think about it, like that's sort of like the beginning. And I loved HBO's Rome. I really loved that series. Um, and what's cool is I always loved the story of the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. I remember we had these, these books. They were like kids' encyclopedias. 
And there was this one book that was like battles about freedom. And the concept was, it was all these historical events where people were the underdog and they rose up. It was all these revolutions and the battle of Tudorburg forest was in it. And I don't really remember all of what was in that book, but I remember reading about it and thinking like, Oh, the Romans and then like piecing these things together. And when it was, it was a few years ago when I was doing the podcast issue zero, when it started and I interviewed Teeny Howard and we got talking about spoilers. Um, and I was, I said like, are you, do you have a problem with spoilers? Because I don't have a problem with spoilers because it's not what happens. It's how it happens. And I was like, exactly. Yeah. And then there's a truth she, to that. Yeah. And she brought up Rome and she's like, I love Rome, but I know what's going to happen. Like I know how that Caesar dies. I know that Augustine comes in and becomes the next emperor. Uh, like, you know, all these things like, but what's the allure in watching? It's watching it unfold is what makes it so compelling and interesting. Right. And you're relying on the performances and the writing and all that. And I remember that interview, I kind of began formulating the idea of doing dead Romans, doing this story about the battle of Tudorburg forest. And when I was thinking about doing it, it was, I, I didn't know who to get to draw it. And that was a real big, like, who do I do? And Kalman Andrasovsky was a guy that I am friends with. And, and he told me, he goes, there's a dude named Nick Marenkovich. And he did this book called Kank about this bicycle thief in Toronto. And he goes, he's your guy. He goes, I'm telling you, he's the guy. And I'm like, okay. And it was at a show. Um, and I had the story kind of mapped out. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to take the Arminius, this Germanic prince raised in Rome, uh, who leads this revolt against the Romans. Um, but I wanted to add like, I wanted to make it like a, a love story in the same way that Cleopatra and Mark Antony were this like love story. Like it, you could argue the way they executed it in the Rome series from HBO is a little bit different than that. But that idea of like Bonnie and Clyde, us against the world, you know what I mean? Who can't and relate so, to that? Who doesn't want that? Yeah. So that was the initial idea of what I was going to do. And then, it sort of morphed and changed. And if you read the book, you'll see exactly the way everything goes down. Um, but I went, I had the premise and I had it loosely mapped out with the characters I wanted to incorporate. Um, and so I was, at, I was tabling down from Nick and I went by and he was selling this book called The Voyager, which is right up there on my bookcase, by the way. And then I, uh, it's, it's right there. Okay. And then, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone can see it. So, um, I went up to him and, and then I like, I was, I was like, dude, I'm going to buy your book, but I've got an idea that I want to work on you with. And he's like, you know what? I actually, I've got time. What do you, what do you want to do? And when I explained that it was Rome and I want to do a story about Rome, like Romans, that it was that, that got him. And he wasn't a hundred percent sold, but I, but he was, he was open to the idea. And then we went for drinks, mm. um, at the place that I love going for drinks at downtown say what, which is my, like, that's where I always go. I love the food. I love the drinks, the serves, the servers hate you. They make it clear. They don't care about you being there, which is what I want, <laughs> you know, tell me after. Yeah. So we went, um, we went to, we went to say what, and we had beers and then I came in prepped and I unloaded on him and he was just like, he's like, I'm in. He's like, I'm there. And we talked, nice. I think we, we talked money as a footnote. He brought up like rates and stuff after, cause he was, he was keen to do it. And so then we did, what's cool too, is that I, I gave him the opening six pages. I'm like, honestly, I'm just giving you the six pages. If you want to change some stuff around, go ahead. I'm really loosey goosey with that stuff. I don't, think that it's cool that when you're a writer dealing with an artist you give them a script and they're like stick to it it's like if there's things that you think you can do better like that you know you're good at drawing then focus on that and so 
he gave me the initial cover and the initial cover is actually the first page uh, of the Romans going through the woods. And then I was like, that's gotta be the first page. Like it sets it, that is that page is like a very symbolic micro of the macro, you know, the opening page really establishes the story. You've got these Roman auxilia on horseback and they're sort of like dwarfed by the landscape and there's a lightning bolt and there's the ravens flying around and it's like the storm clouds the storm clouds are gathering the storm is upon them and they don't even realize it and that's how the story opens and it's it's just he got it because the logistics for anybody that's not aware the battle of tudorburg forest was three full legions getting annihilated completely totally annihilated over the course of four days and the logistics involved so this guy arminius unites these tribes in secret over two years and you're talking about like 30 different tribes that all hate each other they just hate rome more and he leads them into a trap and the romans don't even see it coming and then it's just that's how the story opens and it's it is a horrific horrific story but it's good. It's very entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the the love for Roman Empire, or like the history of the Roman Empire, started from what you saw as a kid. Yeah, being at that. Well, there's still Roman ruins all over Europe. There's still all kinds of stuff. Like there's fragments of an aqueduct here. There's a road here. Yeah. There's a, there's a historic site here. There's a museum there. There, it's everywhere. And and the. What's interesting, too, there's the thing called the language line, the Germanic and the Romantic languages. And the Romantic languages are really all derivative of Rome. And the line is the Rhine. Like, it's, it's, that's the line. And that language line exists because of the Tudorburg Forest. Because when the Romans were driven out of Germania, they never went back in. Like, they went back in to fight people, but they never colonized germania again they never turned into a roman province and so everything east of there stayed germanic like all the languages are germanic and everything west of it is romanic like french uh spanish italian uh great britain is different because of the saxon invasions but up until the saxon invasions they were also speaking romanic languages latin was the predominant language until the yeah. saxons came in so yeah, like the, and that's all because of the Tudorburg force. Like the historical connotations because of that battle are pretty profound. Yeah, so it was the the element of Mark Anthony, the the for, forbidden yeah. love, forbidden that love. Bonnie and Clyde during while all this is happening. Like this, yeah, is the, very cool. I like. So it. the 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 main characters, Honoria and Arminius, Honoria is. Uh, actually, you know what? I don't want to give any of that away. I'm just gonna say that ah. when you wrote that first. I know when you see that when you read, you, I when you see the opening pages, they're really in love. Yeah, and that's that's what really matters. And then Arminius is telling her, and that's what I love. The so when I talked, I said that micro and the macro thing. Hmm. Um, that I got that line from Francis Manipal. Francis Manipal was he told me like the the way to uh, really sell a story as a pitch is to have something that encapsulates the whole story in a very minute sense. And all the elements that come to play in the story as a whole are on full display in the opening nine pages of the book. They're all there. And I was very conscious about trying to do that because at the core of this story, you've got two people that are madly in love and the empire stands between them, you know, and right. he's, he's, his first line is like, you're a queen. And she's like, I'm a slave. He goes, you're my queen. And she's like, mm. does that make you a king? And his response is it might. And like, that's, and you know, that's all that's coming. Like <laughs> all of the, all the things that he's saying, he's laying out like he's, and as a dude and they're, men and women's brains approach romance in very different ways. Right. Um, like, and the weird grab, but there's a line in uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Mm -hmm. 
it's not that says, weird. And she goes, men speak of love conveniently. And it's like, yeah, we do. But I do believe that even in the most stoic of dudes, there is this great well of repressed romance. And Arminius is living in an era where he the things that he's seen firsthand the things that he's done firsthand are horrific like horrific traumatizing events and you can like when i read that dialogue i can feel him like he's tearing himself apart needing to tell her what he feels and what he's doing and what he wants but he can't and there's even a scene later on when one of his closest companions is like, why didn't you just tell her? And he goes, because I was trying to keep her safe. The less she knew, the better. And it's like, that's a very, and our editor, Allison O'Toole, who's amazing. She was even like, are you worried about saying something like that? I needed to keep her safe. It's almost like, it's, it's almost tropey. It's almost a cliche thing. And I'm like, yeah, it is sort of a trope, but it's, that is what he's doing like that, but it's a that, real thing that's not yeah. a, that's not a trope where people can't relate because i think a lot of times and this is something you sometimes learn the hard way is like why did you lie to me yeah because i love you yeah like you I, know? I i know that this was gonna hurt you so i i didn't want to yeah and it's like and you could argue is that right and and that's when the interesting to, part. When you get to the end of the story, you'll find yeah. out whether what he did was right or not. And and I'm really stoked. I want to bring up Allison specifically because I'm I do a lot of like the interviews and the chats and the whatnot. And and the the thing that I I need to call out is how gra grateful I am to work with somebody like Allison. Uh, I have a prof. A profound amount of love and appreciation for her because she when we worked on the story number one she told me to be more confident in my story she she told me i needed to be more confident she's like it's a good story and you need to sell it you need to be confident in it i was like okay and then she was saying how um when i would write something she'd be like what are you trying to impart with the scene like she goes because this is what i'm getting is this what you're trying to do and I'd be like, yeah, this is what I want. And she's like, well, how can we make that bigger? Let's bring more. Let's bring more. And it's like, I like, I'm so grateful to have gotten to work with her on the story because the ending, the ending was the ending. The same things end up happening, but we just tweaked a few things around in terms of perspective. And I, and what was funny was when I had those conversations because Nick had already planned out a few pages and then I came back and like, we got to make changes. And he hadn't drawn anything at this point, but he just had a vision in his head about what he wanted to do. And when I came back, I'm like, we're making changes. Like, I don't want to make changes. So I'm like, we have to make changes. And then I explained why. And it was, it's funny because I was the same way. I was like, I don't want to make changes. <laughs> and then we made the changes and now both of us are like it's just so much stronger like the way it ends it's got like this yeah dark fairy tale ending and i'm so excited for people to see it and for it to sell millions of copies and get turned <laughs> into a, a major motion picture etc film you franchise. Know what? you gotta you gotta say it mm. you gotta think sometimes where you like that would be cool to have because when you start seeing that's when the possibilities you know you got to knock on that door in some way even if it's in a man imaginative way but uh, to your point about allison that was her name right yeah. i remember yeah. correctly. the true collaboration to to really make good art oftentimes requires you to like you got to come in with the ego to say like i've got a good story that yeah. i need to share with people but then you also have to know like how can can you help me make it better yeah and i think that that's uh that's the, the role of an editor is to is to take a good story and make it great and and just help out the the writer with the things that they're not seeing because you like if this is a story that takes place in a forest there's times you can't see the forest through the trees like no pun intended on any of that but there were times where i just really did get stuck in what i was seeing and what i knew was happening behind the scenes rather than selling what was really going on and this is like, I've written a lot of books and I've written a lot of comics over the years, but this is like 
this is image. Like, this is the big deal. This is shadow line and image. And, and a huge shout out to Jim Valentino as well uh, mm -hmm. for really believing in the story. And he imbued me with confidence. And as soon as, as soon as uh, shadow line gave us the thumbs up, that's when I went to Allison because that is when I was like, Oh God, I got to make it really good now. And so getting her in really, I think, guaranteed massively improved the final product. Right. Well, that's, I think that's sometimes the, like every great artist has to know when to get out of their own way. Right. Yeah. And I mean, having done certain things in a creative uh, environment myself, sometimes someone says, Hey, don't do it like that. Do it. Like, it doesn't mean that you didn't write that thing. It doesn't mean that it's not your story. Yeah. It just means like, here's the way to make people like it more. And, and you, you might thing. not see it. So she's working with Chip Zdarsky. Right. And if Chip Zdarsky is sitting there going, you're right. I'm not Chip Zdarsky. Okay? Yeah, like, you, I have no business saying you're wrong. You want the like, same coach. I right? want the, exactly like he's amazing. His books are incredible. And I want to be putting out product on that level too. And you know how you get good. You, if you want to be great, surround yourself with great people. And yeah. Yeah. I have a phenomenal team uh, on this book with me. I'm just a part of it. Like Nick, Allison, Jose, uh, Andrew. I am so glad to be working with these. And Jim as well. He's off like he basically is like the guy that we give him the book. And he goes, <laughs> I like the book. I'm going to make this good. And he does all the dressing. There's been a few times I think I've irritated Jim with my dumb questions. And he's like, I mean, listen, I know you're new at this, but you don't do that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, just like that. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, you yeah. got to learn, right? Absolutely, man. That's the only way you're, you're going to be able to pass that information on is you've got to make that yeah. mistake, right? Yeah. What's that like? Having been a kid reading comics in 91 during that time of the Infinity Gauntlet and Image being formed to now you writing for Image. And yeah. Well, I gave up on comics. Yeah, I gave up. Like I, I threw in the towel. I think I talked to you. I we did an interview a while ago when I was mm -hmm. doing like the radio play, which I'm doing a second season of that right now. By the way, very cool. Uh, so I had when going back the beginning of the pandy, the pandy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I when there was the infamous pencils down moment. Right. I had been pushing so hard in the fall of 2019, uh, getting and I had three pitches that were out there and two of them were pretty much a lock and one of them was kind of floating around. Um, and when I say a lock, like it was the, let's get the contracts together. Let's get this all talked out. We want this. We're excited about it before the contracts and everything. Cause the pitching process can take a while. Like, so when I say the fall, like I'm talking close to like right before Christmas break, I'm sending out pitch packages kind of thing. So I send all these things out. And then when the pencils down moment happened, everything fell apart. Like everything fell apart. And I was just, I was just done. And I was done with like trying to work with other people and everything about it. I was so fed up. And so I got into like working on like just radio play stuff. And I was doing like the Star Wars radio play. Um, I got to come back on later to talk about it because it's a whole other thing. We'll have to do a yeah. whole episode about just that. But great, was, great. so I was working on that. I was working on Mud 79, the Mud 79 radio play, uh, which is like Platoon meets Star Wars is the best way to describe yeah, it. Very and, cool. But uh, the that I was honestly, I was it's weird. It, it's super serendipitous. I was just, just, just about finished the final episode of Mud 79. Like, I think I was like, still had like 15 minutes left to produce like edit put together the sound effects and all that stuff masters and then nick sent me the pages he's like here you go and i'm like i completely forgot about this because i that's the thing is like nick was working on other things and he was just working on this on the side and it was so like i was the it was that that con in the fall of 2019 and he's like it's gonna take me a while and i kind of like got all like just 
I didn't reach out to him. I kind of was like, whatever, it's not happening. It's not right, happening. right. And I and I kind of like walked away from everybody that I knew in comics, aside from like my friends that work in comics, that I'm friends with them outside of the fact that they also do comics. But uh, I was done. I didn't care. Was, who cares? Like I tried. Like I, I I did a whole bunch of small press stuff. I was in a bunch of anthologies and everything. But like it's not meant to be like clearly the universe is sending me a message. So I was super into the audio production because then it's just, I write it, I get the voices because I send my friends the voice parts and they read them. And then I just do it all myself. I didn't need to really rely on a lot of people. And that's what I wanted. And then when he sent me the pages, I was like, wow, this is, this is really good. And so I got a friend named Steph Gert. And she dabbles in a lot of comic stuff as well. And, and I actually played, I would play Assassin's Creed with her online. Mm-hmm. And then she's a, knowing that she's a big comic book fan. I was like, Hey man, can you just take a look at this? So I, there's two people that I sent. It, I sent it to Calman who pointed me in the direction of Nick and Calman was like, and it was funny because I sent it to Calman. I sent it to Steph. I sent it to them. And Kalman was like, this is hot shit. He goes, this is a pitch that is going to turn heads. I am telling you. And it did. Like, the thing is, is it did turn heads. Like, we, and I, and I was, I wanted to send it. So I sent it to humanoids because they're like super cool and they do really cool stuff. <laughs> and I, and like Mark Wade is at humanoids, man. Like, if Mark Wade is reading my stuff, right. And I got an email back and, and they were like, they're, they even said they're like listen we love it but it's just really not in our wheelhouse but we really want to see it when it's done because we know somebody is going to get this book nice um that's that's really nice yeah and it was like they sent me a really lo- and then they, they they gave me advice on how to tweak my pitch a bit i sent it like i sent it to idw and uh idw elizabeth bray is her name or Brie, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong because I've never heard anyone say it. I've only just read it, you know? <laughs> uh, but she was she was a, the editor at IDW that I sent it to, and she's now at Oni. But I sent it to her, and she gave me these phenomenal, phenomenal feedback, and she's like, honestly, the problem is this is just not our genre. We don't do this. Mm. And so I was like, okay, all right, another one, another one. And John Moyson, who was an editor at Skybound, said the same thing. It was historical stuff. He goes... I think it's beautiful, he goes, but the big man in the big chair does not want to do historical stuff. And that's Robert Kirkman. I don't know if you heard right. of that guy. He's yeah. done a few. He's done a few. He's uh, got a couple good books. <laughs> he's, he's got a couple good One books. One or two. Yeah. Yeah. But he like, he's like, he goes, it's so good, but he's just not for us. And I'm like, okay, all right, here we go. <laughs> so you're getting the best possible. Re- no, <laughs> the best rejections you could get. And then and you kept plugging on. That's I awesome. just kept. Pl- well, I, I blanketed it. it was over the course of like two weeks because Steph Girk sent it to um, friends at uh, Boom. Like she was sending my pitch out to people because she's like, I want to see it so bad. And I'm like, <laughs> what a good friend. She's such a good person. And so. <laughs> she she was like she's like when I was telling her I don't know if it's gonna land stuff I'm not getting any positive responses like, you got to keep going you got to keep going I'm like okay yeah. okay and so I didn't send the pitch doc I just sent the pages and I sent them to Jim Valentino at Shadowline and I just said so I wrote I wrote them and this is what I said and I go I, I said I go look at these pages they're beautiful I sent that okay. And so that's it. Like, I think I sent it at like 10 in the morning. I just got to work and I sent it to him, sent it off. And then I got an email back like 20 minutes later and it said, listen, don't tell me your book is beautiful. If it's beautiful, I'll know. And I'm like, really dropped the ball on that one, Kennedy. (laughs) Nice. Nice. So then, so then, so then like, that's it. I'm like, uh, do, do I respond? And then, <laughs> Holy. Like, then it was right after because I'm on air at two, so I'm at I'm at work at ten and I'm prepping and I'm put it beside me. It's gone. Who cares? Move on. We'll move on. It was right after I got into the studio. It was like two fifteen. I get an email from, and it's not from the shadow line. It's from Jim's personal email account. It's, this book is absolutely beautiful. Send me everything you have right now. I want to see it. 
okay. So I sent it to him. He wrote back like right away being like, let's do it. It's done. Let's go. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> did not expect that to happen. Okay. So then I was trying to figure out the, the money of paying to get it done. I was explaining to him mm -hmm. like, listen, like what, what, what am I doing here? So the deal is with like, it's the classic image deal. You get them the book, you pay for everything. And then you, they don't take any rights. They don't have anything. They just get their money back. And then you still own everything. So that's what we did. Like the standard image deal. Like they don't own it. They're just, they, well, no, they have rights for the comic. They have the comic ship, comic book rights. Um, but like, that's fine. I, yeah. Which is, yeah, I'm not, I don't you wanna, want them to make yeah, it in the first place. I want them to have the comic book rights. That's yeah. what we're doing here. That's the yeah, idea. Yeah. Comics with image, the so, TV shows with who I yeah. want to be with. <laughs> so like, and he's like, this will be, uh, this will be one of my, this will be a great book for Shadowline. And so, um, I'm just, I'm so stoked. And then I got to figure out the money situation. Like, how do I pay for all this stuff to happen? And that was really it. Like, I, I had given up. I had totally given up, and I had said no more. I'm done trying. And then this book just landed, and the 22nd it's out march 22nd it's in 20 days so great. pretty yeah it's pretty wild and it was a and kudos to like adam gorham um and mike walsh and ed brisson uh calman like ed brisson mike walsh and adam gorham adam gorham are like the three guys that i've been friends with in the comic book world for like the longest in the sense that i've been the tightest with them um and they were super supportive the whole way and ed uh when i was like got the deal and trying to what do i do how do i handle this what's my next step ed brisson was phenomenal to have as a resource in my corner like he held my hand through everything like this is what you want to do this is how much you want to get this is how many copies you got to sell so yeah he's he's awesome that's good though that I mean, the, the ecosystem in our city for the comic creators is really, really cool because mm -hmm. a lot of people, I, I, from my experience, a lot of people trying to help each other out. You know, it, it is a competitive thing. Everybody wants to get their book noticed and wants people to, you know, you go to a con, there's a limited amount of money out there and you want people yeah. to buy your book, right? But yeah. you also, you want to see your friends succeed too. And along the way, everyone, you know, they, they pick each other up. So it's, it's your turn, dude. Like it, you yeah. deserve it. And you didn't give up. Like yeah. that's, it's, there's been plenty of times, even like I tell my friends, I might quit the podcast this week, this week. Like it's, <laughs> I just do one more. I just do yeah. one. And then something happens because of it. And it's like, you yeah. see, you're not doing it for nothing. Yeah, exactly. So it all like worked out. I'm pretty, I'm pretty jacked for it, man. Like I hope it does. I hope it does well. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to do some signings at like I'm doing the first when the first issue comes out I'm doing a signing at the Silver Snail mm -hmm. on like the 26th so the 26th is when it comes out the Sunday following because my wife works in healthcare so she's always working on Saturdays so I got to go on the Sunday and that's when we're going to do the first signing um and uh great. we're doing we're going to do a signing at the image booth in San Diego and then at New York yeah, so at New York Con, we're going to be at the Image booth doing a signing, too. And yeah, That's man, great. I'm, stoked. I'm pretty stoked about the whole thing. It should be a good time, yeah. You, uh, you're on the radio every day, live, mm -hmm. having to just, you know, be creative and entertaining on the fly. Yeah. But does this make you nervous? Does something make Fred Kennedy nervous? Yeah, absolutely, man. It makes me <laughs> super nervous because it's like a cool kid party. Right. Um, there's, it, it really is. And, and it's just uh, it's just it's it's frustrating because you 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 finally got here you know i it's similar to radio in the sense of like when i got to toronto i was like the goal is toronto the goal is toronto you get to toronto what do you do once you get to toronto i guess i got to figure that out now and so the goal is like get a book get a book a book with one of the big publishers you know like the big five and then you get one and so now i've got this book now what do i do that i've got this book i gotta make something happen with this book and so yeah. now it's like you're on to the next step you're still like what's the next book going to be the next book going to be and it's it, it's it's terrifying 
Um, but I'm pretty stoked. I'm pretty stoked. But I do. I, my wife is. She just popped her head, and I got. I gotta. I gotta get going pretty quick. No problem, dude. <laughs> I'm so thank sorry. you so. No, thank you so much for giving us a uh, you know time in, in a busy day for you. I got more questions for you, but you'll come back. We're gonna talk about mud. Okay. Give me like pick two. We'll go with two right now. Give me two. You know what? You and while me- you're looking. While you're looking, I'll remind everybody that the Oilers <laughs> smoked the Leafs last night. It was beautiful, and Connor McDavid came up and said, "Oh, new Leafs lineup! I'm going to destroy you because I'm Connor McJesus." That's right. Thank there you. we go. Connor McJesus comes along. The only people that care about that are Canadians. Like nobody else cares. <laughs> that's okay. No one cares. But that's like as soon as I saw your Leafs shirts, it's like I got to throw on the orange. I'm throwing it on. That's awesome. No, I like that yeah. you did that. Um, I'll ask you one question. It's a it's a bit of a deep one, but it could be a very simple answer. Okay, what is what is success to you? Mm. Success would be writing every day, and that's how I'm paying my bills. Like just writing and having that be like what I'm doing, like being able to get everything that's in there onto paper. And the problem for me is not having enough in there to put out. It's having the time to do it because I put in about two and a half, three hours of writing every day. Um, That's awesome. Good for you. And right now, uh, because I'm doing the second season of the radio play, an hour of that normal time is gone into production to produce the next season of the radio play. And so I'm, and that to me is like, everything feels like it gets in the way of Mm -hmm. getting that out, you know? So yeah, that's success is just being able to write. Like I would love to be able to just support my family with just writing. And that's all I would do. I love radio. I want to make it clear. Anybody that's like listening in Toronto that I love what I do and I love being on the air. and I love all that stuff. Um, But it's like, I feel like there's like a part of me that really just wants to write full time and I will never quit radio. I will get carried out of that building. But once I'm carried out of that building, I would like to be able to not have to go back to do that again and just focus on this is what I would want to do. It's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope. Fingers crossed. It will. Uh, Manifest. uh, Congratulations. Manifest. Manifest. Congratulations. All the best. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you at Toronto Comic Con. Will you be there? I will be there, definitely. All right. And I will have some some stuff to show you that I know you're going to be very interested in. And I will have – I've got some prints that I'm going to have that I'm going to be selling. We're going to sell a bunch of the covers from the the Dead Roman series. Nice. And maybe if you take a close look, there's some interesting things that are hidden in those covers that could indicate what's going to be coming. Nice. Very cool. All the best. Always a pleasure to talk to you, dude. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, rate and review the show. Subscribe to us. YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You know the deal. Thank you, everybody. Fred, thank you, buddy. Solidarity, brother.